Uh, thanks everyone for um, joining us today. I'm going to um, share some uh, information about our native and invasive Spartina species in San Francisco estuary. And after my Spartina presentation, I'm going to talk about the um, a California Invasive Plant Council, Calypsi project on invasive sea lavender or limonium that we're doing in the transition zones and upper high marsh around the bay as well. And then I'm going to um, hand the baton to some of our local partners for that sea lavender effort, um, the Port of San Francisco, Carol Bach, and um, two folks from Literacy for Environmental Justice Ledge to talk about uh, Hearns Head Marsh and um, the, the com comprehensive restoration work going on there, including uh, limonium work and um, and native uh, na native revegetation restoration planting. Um, and I'm I have a couple. We have some questions at the end for people that are getting a continuing education credits for DPR. And throughout the presentation, if you see a big yellow star on my on the slide, uh, take note of that information because that will be part of the um, part of the uh, qu qu uh, quiz questions at the end, just to help you along a little bit um, in recalling the all the details from a long presentation. So. So why are, we start with a little bit on native tidal marshes because uh, that's what this is really about. It's about preserving and conserving and then allowing us to restore more type native tidal marshes around San Francisco estuary. Um, so obviously flying into San Francisco or Oakland, you fly over salt marshes and former salt ponds in the South Bay and you've driven over the San Mateo or D Dumbarton Bridge. You may have noticed the sinuous blues and greens of the salt marshes or the reds of former salt ponds and that funny sulfur smell that you get. Um, well, they, those salt marshes are very important for the health of San Francisco Bay and us humans who live, work, and play on the edges of the bay. They are very highly productive ecosystems, rich in biodiversity. Um, they are also important carbon sinks, so helpful in combating climate change um, and sequestering carbon. They protect coastal areas from natural disasters, um, acting as a buffer against storm surges and erosion. And they are essentially the upper vegetated portion of mudflats sandwiched between the marine and the terrestrial ecosystems, and they provide a connection between the saline and the freshwater system. They're very productive. The estuaries are kind of the nurseries for the for, for fish and, and other uh, aquatic invertebrates and such for the for the bay and then back even onto the ocean. Um, and they provide no, numerous aquatic and terrestrial critters uh, feed, shelter, and breed in salt marshes. So, so they act as high tide refuge also for birds feeding on the adjacent mudflats, which is very important for our shorebirds, migratory and resident shorebirds. And they provide, provide valuable ecosystem services. Um, one example, helping to protect water quality by filtering contaminants from urban runoff. Globally, we've lost somewhere between 25 and 50% of our tidal marshes to human development, but a great, great deal more here in San Francisco estuary. So here's a couple maps from the um, from, of the, the SFEI, San Francisco Estuary Institute, have put, put together, showing the historical range on the left of our uh, from back around 1800 of our tidal marshes when we had about 200,000 acres of, of wetlands, versus today, and where we have where it shows the um, where it shows the the um, current tidal marshes in a kind of a light green, restored baylands and baylands in an olive green, and then a dark green for planned restoration and enhancement. Um, the conservation community around the bay has set a goal of trying to restore about 100,000 acres of that 200,000 acres of wetlands we had back in 1800. Um, and big efforts are, are underway and have been for now a couple decades in trying to do that. And they're really ramping up, including um, the South Bay Salt Ponds project, which we're this, the Invasive Spartina project is kind of a fundamental part of. Um, the uh, San Francisco Bay contains the largest remaining expanse of tidal salt marshes in the western U.S. and the second largest estuary in the entire United States. Uh, the bay's tidal marshes are extremely productive, like, as I mentioned before, um, creating nutrients and organic material that supports the food web. And marsh plants provide protected areas for many animals for foraging, breeding, and uh, for the Pacific Flyway, as I mentioned previously. So um, because many critters have suffered from the habitat loss, um, there are also a number now that are protected under the state and federal endangered species acts and three examples of those are the salt marsh harvest mouse the california ridgeways rail which is a real focus of our project and the california black rail so what are some of the um, continuing threats to the san francisco bay marshes well climate change is a big threat for salt marshes and um, sea level rise and drowning is a, is a significant concern 
the salt marshes would normally migrate landward as sea levels rise. So into the transition zones with the uplands and convert those to, to marsh over the course of, you know, of time. But of course, we humans have developed much of the land directly adjacent to the salt marsh, rip wrap the edges, armored the edge of the banks to put, you know, corporate parks and all kinds of things from airports to the dumps right up to the edge of the bay. So a lot of there's very little transition zone left. In, in fact, over most of the South Bay, there was virtually none. Um, and it's it's been reduced down to a very, very small thing right at the base of these levees. So unfortunately, that's that's not good for our, our tidal marshes. They have no place to migrate as sea levels rise. Um, so coastal communities will be affected by higher water levels, but so will salt marshes. So we want to build really resilient salt marshes that have the good native components that, and, and as much health as possible um, so that they can they can deal with the the changes that will come from from sea level rise and climate change because we certainly don't understand all the interrelationships going on in salt marshes. We we need to allow them to adapt um, and, and you know with their with their mechanisms of adaptation. So. This slide just shows a tiny window into the San Francisco Bay conservation history. Um, we have lost 85% of our tidal wetlands to date and um, to development. Um, we would have lost a lot more. So the in the the um, 40s to the 60s, there was a plan called the Reber Plan, where they wanted to uh, build two giant dams to create two freshwater lakes and take over the entire bay and fill about 20,000 acres along the East Bay shoreline with shipping channels and locks and um, finally, this this uh, the, over a couple decades, this this effort, this um, this plan finally died in the 60s when the Army Corps of Engineers determined it wasn't feasible. And then in 1961, three women who lived in the East Bay, including one whose last name was Kerr, no relation, um, founded South Save the Bay um, to fight this plan. This plan and their vision helped to turn the bay from a dumping ground in, um, to the treasured open space we see it as today. Um, Save the Bay. Save the Bay also, um, uh, um, see, sorry, hang on a second. Save the Bay also um, helped get the first wetland protection legislation passed in, in the Bay. Um, let me see what am I doing here? Why is this? Oh. Um, which established the BCDC and um, other entities. Um, why is it? Let's see, I'm not sure why I am on this, but I'm going to escape and I'm going to start again with the slideshow. I think it may have been something down there. Okay. All right, and then we get back to it. Somehow it was got off of, off track. I apologize. Okay. Great. And then in the um, 70s and 80s, the first wetland restoration project started to take uh, take hold in the Bay with a desire to re reverse this loss of tidal wetlands. Um, we um, we have the South Bay Salt Ponds project I mentioned briefly. It started in the 70s to restore 15,000 acres of salt ponds. And in 1976, the establishment of the California State Coastal Conservancy, uh, the state lead for the Invasive Spartina project was established. Also in the 1970s, the, the um, Army Corps of Engineers introduced a Spartina alternate flora, um, and we'll talk about that a little more in depth. Um, and that started to to spread and create a hybridation event that creates the, the the main target of the Spartina project, which we'll we'll get into more detail. And then in 2000, um, individual landowners like um, like since we have we have you know U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Army, Army uh, the um, Alameda County Flood Control District, and East Bay Parks were working to control this hybrid Spartina on their lands, but realized quickly that that this rhizominous plant that spread on the tides um, needed a regionally coordinated effort, and the Invasive Spartina Project was established at that point to um, coordinate the, this and, and be a key step in conserving robust native habitat and protecting restoration efforts around the bay. So who are we and we and um, how do we how do the partners work together? So the two leads for this for the um, Spartina project are the Coastal Conservancy state lead and US Fish and Wildlife Service as the service as the federal lead. And um, they um, 
they also have we also have uh, Olson Environmental um, manages uh, and conducts a lot of the work on the ground along with other contractors and Calypsi is another major partner. California Basin of Plant Council is another major partner for in the project. Um, Calypsi is a statewide nonprofit that provides resources for land managers and organizations trying to deal with wildland weeds. Um, and you should check out their website. Um, they have Calypsi.org has um, great uh, resources like the statewide uh, inventory, um, species ID cards, best management practices, manuals, um, and we have an archive from our annual symposia. I'm also on the, serve on the board of the California Basin Plant Council. I'm currently vice president. Um, but in addition to these four co core organizations, we have over 200 partners around the estuary. So if you can imagine the Bay Edge, any jurisdiction, agency or landowner with lands that touch the Bay waters may be one of our partners because they may have habitat where Spartanic can grow. So that includes cities and counties, local, state and federal agencies, water districts, mosquito abatement districts, and then also many private landowners. So first we want to talk about Spartanifoliosa. That's our native Pacific cord grass. Uh, very, a very important um, habitat component of, of the marsh. And this photo here shows the uh, an island pond, one of the restoration projects down in the far south bay that was restored to tidal exchange back in, back in 2006, and then took quite a bit of time to you know, accrete sediment and then build up this beautiful Spart native Spartana community that you see in front of us. So this is a perennial grass in the Poaceae family. It's rhizomatous, so it spreads by a, a lateral roots underground tillers. Um, and it grows in sort of these clones, these round clones and radiates out from the center. Uh, and then those clones coalesce into these meadows like you see in front of me with some bare spots in, in this area where it's still trying to establish. Um, the distribution is limited to California and Baja California, and it's a foundational species in the low marsh. Um, it's an early colonizer um, and it grows also down at, and on the edges of channels. Um, it grows at a very narrow elevational range, kind of, you know, it, it stays in its own lane and it behaves well with the other, plays well with the other kids in the, in the, in the salt marsh. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not this other hybrid Spartan we'll talk about in a minute that's kind of dominates and crosses over these various zones. So. You can see this marsh zonation diagram, which which shows the different um, the different tidal elevations and how they correspond to the different plant communities and different habitat features within the tidal marsh, from the subtidal up into the mudflats, which are unvegetated mudflats in our in our um, in our native systems, and a very important component for for for. Um, for shorebirds, and then low marsh, which is where the Spartana foliosa normally grows, and then uh, grades up into the other areas. So um, the, 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 you can see that the, this heterogeneity of, of, of all these zones across the marsh are very important, and that's what is, uh, those are the things that are lost when um, a hybrid Spartana monoculture takes over all of those zones from mudflat up to high marsh and kind of makes them this uniform thing. So. And then I just want to mention more than 99% of the core grass in the estuary is Spartanifolio. So there was certainly a big, a big concern about it going extinct if we had allowed the hybrid Spartana to go to run rampant throughout the bay. But of course, over the past 17 to 20 years of this project working, we have reduced that down and 99% of the core grass in the estuary is Spartanifolio. So we have four species of invasive Spartina in, in the bay. I'm only going to really focus on two of them today. Um, I'll quickly say that English core grass, Spartina anglica on the left, and Spartina patens um, down in the, in the right corner are only in, um, we've been able to keep them to just a single site around the bay where they were introduced many years ago. And uh, we're very close to eradication, like single digit square meters worth of th those species left um, in the bay. And I'll, I'll talk more about Spartina densiflora um, a little bit that's mostly in Marin County, but has a very interesting IPM strategy that we've implemented to get it to, to get it to uh, eradication levels where we're, we're very close to at this point. Um, so I really want to share that with you as considering that's a, a big uh, interest of the of the audience. And then hybrid Spartina is the main um, is the main target of the Spartina project because it's the one that was most widespread and has the, the most significant impacts over the course of the, the esh, over the, the extent of the estuary. Um, smooth cord grass Spartina alternaflora was introduced by the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1970s and it subsequently hybridized with our native Spartina foliosa to create this hybrid swarm that's the, that exists now. So um, we, we no longer have any of the parent invader Spartina alternate flora, the pure uh, East Coast cord grass. We either have the hybrid or we have the native parent Spartina foliosa. And as I just mentioned, 99% of the Spartina remaining in the bay is over the, you know, the 70,000 acres of the bay is, is the native. 
<clears throat> okay, so uh, yeah, as I mentioned, the the um, Spartano alternate floor was introduced, and we had the hybridization event occurred sometime in the 1980s, um, and um, then was it was kind of a novel event at the time, and then was discovered in the mid-1990s when folks started studying the the uh, Spartana to try to get a better understanding of the invasion and what they might do. Um, what the what they do might do to 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 deal with the outcomes of it. Um, the the hybrid is a hybrid swarm, and so it has this back crossing over multiple generations, producing this highly fertile um, swarm that that means that it has a wide variety of different morphologies and phenologies. Um, you know, some might flower at this time, some might uh, flower at this time. It's a nest at different times, um, and it, they can also have what's called transgressive traits, which they can exploit all the tidal niches of of the of the um, the different zones that I pointed out in that other diagram from growing much lower in the tidal regime out onto the mudflats that are supposed to be unvegetated, as well as all the way through the marsh plain, through the channels, and up into even the high marsh where normally Spartina wouldn't grow. Okay, I think I'll skip over that because I pretty much have touched on that, but the, oh, this this does show the, the wider range, as you can see on the right-hand side um, of zonation diagram, the much wider range, whereas the Spartana foliosa is normally confined to a much narrower range within the within these tidal marshes. Okay, and you also see a um, yellow star in this one, so we can't pay, those are going to be taking the quiz later on, um, keep this in mind. So, um, why is Nef why is this hybrid Spartina problem? Well, by outcompeting all other tidal marsh species, it resulting it, 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 it produces this monoculture of this hybrid Spartina, which can change the hydrology within the within marshes by uh, clogging the channels and not allowing water to flow through and having the natural tidal exchange, and also accreting sediment within those channels and filling those channels. And we have a, the next slide shows an interesting uh, um, um, example of how, exhibit of how how much of an ecosystem engineer this this plant can be. Um, hybrid Spartina also spread rapidly across mudflats, and we it's an explicit goal of the Spartina project to um, kind of re reverse that and restore those mudflats so that they are un unvegetated um, and remove those meadows of cord grass where they're where they're where they're and retort, restore that to the uh, foraging for migratory shorebirds. Um, a lot of UC Davis research was done in the early time of the Spartina project in the early 2000s, showing that the very thick roots of this hybrid Spartina produced so much underground biomass that it actually excluded the invertebrates that would normally, the benthic invertebrates that would normally um, be part of that, that part of the food web. And that invertebrate biomass um, that represents the food base for larger critters like birds, fishes, crabs, et cetera, declined by greater than 70%. Um, a lot of the remaining invertebrates in those systems shifted to surface from surface feeders available to the shorebirds and other consumers to below ground feeders that are unreachable and unaccessible. So, um, and then as I mentioned, if left unchecked, that there was a worry that the hybrid Spartina could cause the extinction of Pacific cord grass by outcompeting it and then pollen swamping it because it'll swamp it with all its greater load of pollen and it'll make the, the native produce hybrid seed, which then further further exacerbates the problem. So very complex stuff. I'm just touching on a lot of these things today because of the in essence of time, but um, uh, it, it's, it's a very complex issue. So we also have a possible increasing mosquito breeding areas by increasing ponding. And because it's such a fast colonizer, especially in these open slates of new restoration projects, it can quickly um, turn a restoration site into a monoculture of hybrid Spartina and throw that off the trajectory of development that we're looking for, uh, developing a diverse diverse um, native marsh with the, the full complement of the plant assemblage that, that we expect to see there, and then all the inherent um, uh, functions and values that we would see in a native, in a native system. This is just a quick diagram to show, um, it, like in 1986, at the very top, you can see in that red box, you can see just a few clones of the of the hybrid Spartina growing out into the mudflats in um, in the San Lorenzo, uh, San Leandro area. And then 20 years later, less than 20 years later, you can see all that Spartina marsh that had been accreted by that. Um, and again, this is not uh, accreting and developing a native marsh, which would be, you know, sort of a great thing. That would be that would be um, nice, almost good for sea level rise, combating sea level rise, right? No, it's creating this Spartina monoculture, which not only stays, st it doesn't just stay put in that one area where it's created that land, but of course, then infests all the extant marshes adjacent to it and makes all those changes that we've that I've already talked about. So um, in response to the threats to the estuary, the, the ISP, the Invasive Spartina Project, was initiated to coordinate estuary-wide Spartina control efforts. 
um, was initiated in 2000, but really began full scale implementation in 2005 after EIR and lots of other um, partnership building and, and, and such. Um, now we are talk, we talk about annual surveys over about 70,000 acres to inform the treatment program. Uh, we started out it was uh, about 50,000 acres. Uh, this slide gives you a visual uh, visual of the extent of this of where hybrid spartan has been found in the estuary over the course of the project. It's sort of a heat map um, because you can see how the red heavy infestations. Uh, how much red heavy infestation there was over thousands of acres of the South Bay in the early years of the project and the, the um, in the map on the left hand side in, in 2005. Um, dark green shows no hybrid, um, red more than an acre of hybrid in that area. Um, and then you can see as it kind of transitions over time to the to the right, um, how we move from red to orange to yellow to green um, over that decade, that first decade of implementation. Um, we, we have had um, ex some expansions into areas other, either by natural movement on the tides or by, um, you know, propagules getting caught on equipment or whatever and getting introduced to areas like we had I uh, found a new infestation in Sassoon in, in 2016 um, that was that did not get there likely on its own because the nearest infestation is quite a ways away and it's not the not the um, not in the direction of the tidal flow really uh, in that area. So about 11 miles from the nearest infestation. So uh, probably some construction equipment brought it in. In. Um, so, but fairly small e expansions, but we do have to expand our footprint of survey then um, in that area, and that takes that takes time and money. So, this shows the general trajectory of the hybrid spartina reduction. Um, we reduced it by 96% estuary wide. Um, some heavy reductions early in the spartina project, and then um, kind of bumping along towards our asymptotic approach to to um, to to zero low numbers, um, removing that threat. From hybrid spartina supports the regional and native tidal marsh restoration efforts were sort of a foundation for that. Um, we started with about 805 net acres and uh, we're down to 33 acres in, in 2020 and I believe this year where we're looking at about 22. Um, so the scale of the effort is kind of vast and it's sort of hard to convey in a PowerPoint presentation, but um, the, I don't know if you can spot the two biologists looking for hybrid spartina in this photo in this beautiful native marsh that's got kind of pickleweed playing with a lot of spartina kind of grading up into it, um, but uh, here's where they're at. Um, so that's just one marsh in, uh, you know, over the 70,000 acre footprint of marshes and mudflats that we have to survey each year. Um, the the uh, OEI biologists survey um, Olson environmental biologists inventory up to 70,000 acres each year. Um, the benefits of this in extensive inventory and mapping are that it saves time and physical exhaustion if we have to have send treatment crews back out to these areas. And then those crews only go to the to those to the areas where the um, features have been mapped. So that reduces impacts to the sensitive habitats um, and also reduces the, the impacts on the workers themselves. Um, we uh, chaperone folks out to the to the treatment, so our biologists also accompany the treatment crews out to the mapped features to um, help them with detection. Um, sometimes they'll pick up additional hybrids since it's, it can, some of them can be quite cryptic, um, and they will help them um, minimize their impact by finding pathways through the marsh to get to access what needs to be treated. Um, and see, we do extensive genetic testing each year, about 500 samples to identify hybrids before treatment and to preserve as much of the native um, folios as we can. And um, the hybrid spartina has many phenotypic variations, as I said, this hybrid swarm. So depending on marsh conditions, and there's a lot of variability even in the native across the bay in different areas. So that so we really have to know our stuff. Our, our experts go out there and do this mapping to inform the treatment crews in, in, their, in their work. The 2020 project area has about 220 sub areas. Um, we have uh, we uh, we um, I have already covered that stuff on the the um, basically the little extent of it. Um, this is a this is a fun slide for for me. I've been involved with the project for so long. Um, as of 2020, we of that 220 sub areas, 151 of them now contain under 10 square meters of invasive spartina. So a huge percentage, and you can see how that's broken down in the table at the bottom. We have about we have 48 sites last year. I think it's up to about 56 this year. Year there that had zero um, zero detection we call it of, of native spartina then then another 50 sites in the zero to one square meter this is net cover 
um, and then one to 10 square meters, another 50 sites. So huge, um, huge accomplishment. Um, you know, eradication is a very high, par high bar, getting it to zero with in a matrix of the one of the parent species, uh, this hybrid is of course a, a big challenge. So um, we uh, understand that, but um, you can see the vast majority of the of the bay is being well protected. And if a, if a, a you know, an uninitiated folk person went out to one of these marshes to look for hybrid Spartina, they may not, they may not be able to detect any. Um, it's so it's down to such low levels at so many marshes. And then we have our moderate infestations, and we still have some heavy infestations as well um, um, for various reasons. Um, in the San Francisco Peninsula, our status is um, is uh, the, from Chrissy Field all the way down to Point San Bruno, which actually goes down into San Mateo County, are all zero detection. So all the sites. Um, and this is this is actually the first year of that because we've had one lingering one or two lingering infestations. We had one in Yosemite Slough. I don't know if any of the state parks folks are here today, but um, this is actually the first year that San Francisco County is at zero detect. The whole the whole um, San Francisco County for for hybrid Spartina for any species of Spartina. So that's fun to share with you folks. Um, OEI biologists also use genetic sampling, as I mentioned, um, to help inform when when we have an uncertain field identification. Since we have these various morphologies, and some can be very cryptic, some can look often a lot like the native at different in different at different times, especially in different stages of its more maturation. Um, or and we can't map everything at exactly the optimal time to detect um, to detect the hybridity. You know, if we could go out at the peak mapping when the when it's exactly flowering, it's often easier to detect. But because we still have a lot of Ground to cover every year, we have to go out at suboptimal times to, to, to map some of this stuff. Um, you know, all kind of in that August, September, October, July, July through October window, but some of them are suboptimal. So we use the genetic testing to identify that, um, to identify the, the, um, the, the hybrids and preserve as much of the native as we can. Um, also, if we have a new invasion at a site, we uh, might do a genetic testing to, con to confirm that. Um, we also collect some sure thing hybrids. To, as a baseline for the um, for the program structure that we use to 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 do the DNA analysis, and also to confirm Spartina foliosa that we harvest from from areas and then grow out in beds at the watershed nursery before we outplant it at, at in in restoration efforts. We confirm genetically that it's Spartina foliosa before um, putting that back out into the environment. We use microsatellite genetic analysis, um, and as I mentioned, the program structure is a piece of uh, software that's used by our geneticist um, Brian Ort to uh, make calls on the on the um, on the, the hybrid or native native uh, nature of the plants. So you can see in this, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, kind of beyond the scope of this presentation, but um, you can see a very distinct Spartina foliosa native cluster there in the green spike, um, with then with some background levels of diversity uh, as it grades. Um, upward there to the right, um, but then the hybrid is spread out over a much wider range, right? Um, it's got a much, much, much wider, um, that, that hybrid swarm is really showing itself there, that it's it's much more diverse and there's, um, and that it also grades back into the natives. So in that overlapping region between the Spartina foliosa green and the red hybrid Spartina is less certain, uh, but because our goal is, you know, to, to eradicate, um, our threshold for what to treat is set pretty far to the left on this graph. So we do wind up treating most of what lands in that overlapping region. Um, but we, of course, want to preserve as much uh, of the diversity within the native Spartana folio so, as possible. So we, you know, we, we're cons always considering that when we make these dis decisions. Is that right? Yep. So treatment program. So the tools in our toolbox for our, for the treatment program for the hybrid Spartina alternate flora, it is mainly aquatic herbicide, and I'll get into that in a second. We have used tarping in some low energy environments, uh, and when it's a very small footprint, but um, but they need a lot of maintenance um, to be, because the tides will lift them off of, of even when they're well staked into the ground, and they'll create sediment on top of them. So if there's an infestation around, they'll actually grow on top of the tarp. Um, we have used them to some success in places like Point Reyes National Seashore um, to reach eradication at that site over the years. They're very time intensive and, and actually quite costly. Um, but the, uh, the herb, herbicide is the main is the main tool in the toolbox for in the ar armamentarium for um, Spartina alternate flora hybrid. Um, for the Spartina densiflora, which I'll get into this, the interesting story on that, as I mentioned, we can, it's a, it's a discreetly rooted bunch grass, so we can dig it. Uh, we've also mowed it and tarped it in a very complex IPM strategy that I'll get into. Um, all this is done from from access from foot um, by boat by airboat a lot of, of, of stuff and also um, by truck 
Um, we carefully planned access and habitat and species protections. Um, you, you know, with our biological chaperones working with the treatment crews, we do the inventory monitoring first, as I mentioned. Um, it, most of the stuff now at this point in the in the project is for is, is spot treatment. It, we try to minimize the impacts to the habitat around uh, around it, of course. Um, luckily, pickleweed is very resilient to um, amazapir herbicide too, so that bounces back quite quite well. Um, so that's we don't usually have a clean slate. Um, uh, um, uh, effects on the, the, the environment. Um, our hybrid Spartina treatment season goes from about June to November, and we about 150 sites were treated this year to one extent or another. So Spartina densiflora, um, it's just really interesting. So I want to share this with you, even though there is there was never really any uh, Spartina densiflora in the peninsula. Um, what, our current methodology that we've been doing for, for about seven or eight years now, um, all historical sites are surveyed twice annually, first in early June, when any flower stalks can help with detection. They stick up above the 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 um, the native um, the native pickleweed and cover. And then a second time in January, when most of the marsh is sleeping, it's kind of in this in this different condition and the color is is of the of the Spartina densiflora target really stands out. Um, as opposed to the, the hybrid Spartina that's rhizominous, this is a discreetly rooted, rooted bunch grass. So it's the one Spartina species where digging manual removal is very effective. And so we, we um, all plants for the for Spartina densiflora are dug and disposed off site. We haven't had to use herbicide at all since about 2012 on this. On this. Um, last year, we had about 66 seedlings detected throughout the entire estuary, only about 5.6 square meters. Uh, they were all removed and, and um, the seed bank lasts about five years or more. So, you know, we're, we're constantly going back to those historical footprints and looking for those seedlings twice annually. Um, we've had about, you know, 99.9% .9 reduction from the peak infestation. Um, I just wanted to show some some old photos of, of what we first discovered. You know, we were treating this with herbicide and we saw that we really were getting these, this Mars of the Living Dead situation where the established stands um, one year post treatment had this yellow gray green appearance. They were kind of half dead, but they were not actually dead. If you cut them and looked inside the, the stems, there was still green matter and they would bounce back um, the following year. So and they were also not healthy enough to translocate any other herbicide application. Um, in addition, this necromass, the standing dead biomass is very persistent. Um, so we, um, this is the, the Mars of the Living Dead up close, you can see. Um, so we went in and started to use a more complex um, uh, um, IPM strategy that I developed with uh, with our partners and friends of Corvidera Creek, Sandy Goldman in, in Marin County. Um, and we would go in in the, the season when when uh, the, the Ridge, Ridgeways Rail were, were not breeding. And I would start mowing some of this, uh, some of these areas to start to stress the plants. Um, it allowed us for to do best assessments of what plants were actually still alive. And um, and then we, we, we would come in and when they we got regrowth in the initial years during the early part of the year when it was still Ridgeway's real breeding season, we would do an herbicide application essentially just to arrest development of the plants and stop seed production and dispersal. Even though it wouldn't necessarily kill all the plants, it would kill some and it would stop them from producing more seed and feeding that five-year seed bank. And then we would come in after Ridgeway's real breeding season mow the, re the reduced amount of, of um, because of mowing was had reduced the um, the amount of uh, biomass, we were reducing the amount of herbicide needed as well. So then we would come in after that season and we would um, do the digging and mowing activities to kind of maintain this strategy and do those for a few years until we could come in and just fully remove individual plants without doing damage to the entire marsh plain. Because, um, you know, you're once you're digging in a marsh plain, you're disturbing the integrity of that soil that's built up over, you know, many, many years. So you don't want to do that damage. You're changing the elevation, the micro elevation of that and changing the entire plant community assemblage that that will grow on that so it's um so we wanted to be as low impact as possible and herbicide allowed us to do that in in concert with these other methods um and then this is the result was um passive recruitment by lush pickleweed and native spartina foliosa colonized the the site you can see where, that's exactly where i was mowing and just a few years later that level of lush growth was was colonizing that area so um that's, that's all I'm going to do on Densiflora for today because we have so much we're trying to cover. But um, the herbicide we use for we, we used for the Densiflora in that limited manner, and the, the one we use for hybrid Spartina is a Mazapir. Um, US EPA considers a Mazapir category four to wildlife, so that's in the practically non-toxic category to wildlife, including mammals, birds, fish, and aquatic invertebrates. 
Um, ISP water quality monitoring that we've done for our, for our MPDS compliance um, detects far lower concentrations than the published levels of concern for wildlife um, immediately post treatment as well as one week post treatment. And those one one week post treatment samples have normally shown a reduction of about 90 percent um, because it's broken down by UV sunlight as well as as well as obviously we have the twice daily tidal exchange as well, which helps to to break that down. So um, and we have a low Mazapir, as you know, folks that work in the field has a low potential to bioaccumulate. It's not carcinogenic or mutagenic or or a neurotoxin. So. Uh, just a few a few quick methodology slides because it's so uh, interesting to folks like you. You guys that work in the field, um, we did a pilot project in 2008 using airboats to access um, the the um, the mud flats and such at very low or receding tides when there was just a few inches of water on an outgoing tide because that allowed us the maximum dry time. In other words, the amount of time before the tides would come back in and inundate the plants, so the herbicide could get on the plants and get into the plants and start to translocate throughout the plants and, as a systemic herbicide does and get the effects that we need. And now airboats are you know such a part of our, our project we would. We not be able to even work without them. We also were able to replace our impacts from using amphibious vehicles, which you would drive in from the landward edge through the airboats because we could pull up on the water edge, come into the site. Although, of course, as you can see by the footprints there, it's a very difficult place to walk. Um, but it would reduce the impacts to the rail and mouse habitat by coming in across the pickleweed plain, across the high marsh and mid marsh uh, in different, you know, either by foot on foot or by amphibious vehicles. And you could come into the site, haul out. Uh, with the air from the airboat 100 meters of hose and, and do the work that we need to do um, and this is just a demonstration of the difference with, between the dry times so in the previous year that created the results that you're seeing in this photo um, apparently the 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 upper part of this area got got the sufficient dry time and you get like 99 percent efficacy the lower part did not get the sufficient dry time and got near zero percent efficacy and you can see a little zone in between where we got a, a more moderate growth regrowth so that's that's just how important it is for us to plan around the tides we plan very strictly around the tides we get very narrow tide windows each year to do this during the active growing season for the plant so it's a huge challenge a huge juggling act um, to do that and speaking of juggling acts and balancing, um, we have to balance in, invasive species and endangered species in, in the tidal marshes. So because we um, human development has led to such massive loss of tidal wetlands in San Francisco Bay, the wildlife that, that remain are dependent on the tidal marshes are also now, some of them are also now endangered species, as I mentioned before, like the salt marsh harvest mouse and the Ridgeways rail. Um, this, you know, our human actions led to the introduction of this highly invasive species from another region of the world that came from, you know, we brought this from another place and introduced it. It was not present here in the first place and it had, it did not have its checks and balances to, to keep it in, in balance with the ecosystem and it, it threw the, the, um, the town marsh ecosystem out of balance. So how do we balance removing the invasive species while protecting the endangered species? Well, adaptive management um, um, through the treatment, through restoration efforts, through surveys to assess the population of the of the endangered um, Ridgeways rail, especially, and then the reconsultation through with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as we move along and evaluate that um, over time and, and uh, incorporate those changes into our into our project. So the hybrid Spartina did have benefits to the Ridgeways rail because it created this novel habitat where there was none before by growing out into these mud flats and creating this these Spartina meadows and provided this cover at high tide that the Ridgeways rails use. But of course, after the invasion, little of the native habitat remained at some sites, and then there's all the other impacts from the natives from the hybrid Spartina invasion. So what we do um, with our partners as well, um, we we go out and do the, use the North American Secretive Bird uh, Secretive Marsh Bird Survey Protocol, doing call counts, um, ten minute call counts at points along a transect for Ridgeways Rail during the the active uh, breeding pre breeding season, like January fifteenth to April, through April fifteenth. We broad broadcast Ridgeways Rail and Black Rail calls and take note of of the uh, you know this the survey results represent a subset of the population of the site. They are not a census for these reclusive marsh birds that sometimes don't call, and if they don't call, you don't know they're there. Um, but research has shown that about 60% detection probability, um, about a 60% detection probability um, uh, from using this, this method. So that's pretty that's pretty high and gives us a good general sense of, of what's going on with the rails. And this is general this this graph shows generally what what is the the general trajectory for the rails. As you can see, the dotted line is the actual results um, from all from the IFS Spartana project and other partners like Fish and Wildlife Service, Point Blue Conservation Sh Science, showing the um, the uh, the general trajectory of the rails increasing over over time. 
especially after the initial years where we were removing big areas of this of the hybrid Spartina since so this is showing from 2010 through 2020. And then our restoration program is very focused on habitat enhancements um, to benefit the California Ridgeways Rail. So the rest, ISP restoration program is going on for about 10 years. Um, it has a guiding plan that's informed by the Technical Advisory Committee. Um, it's a baywide effort um, that's focused on the critical components that rails need, uh, which is cover from predators for foraging, um, areas for them to, to nest, and areas for extreme high tides, uh, for refugia during extreme high tides. And we again, we again use adaptive management in our in our restoration pro pro program, learning from the enhancements and learning from what we've um, what we've done in the past. For example, in our first year of the program, we lost many of our native cordgrass plantings at one site due to grazing by Canada geese. So we experimented with rope rope caging, and now um, at new sites, we initially use rope caging to protect at least half of the native cordgrass uh, until we can assess the likelihood of grazing. This shows about the, the 40 sites that have been um, have had restoration and habitat enhancements over, over the past 10 years. We planted approximately 530,000 plants, including primarily Pacific cordgrass and marsh gum plant, as the yellow star indicates. That's our other the the two native uh, the two main components of our of our efforts. We've also created these constructed these these high tide refuge islands. With these mounds um, at, at about 16 sites um, that um, that stick up above the marsh plain at a very high tides, and they're then planted with um, with grindelia as well, with the gum plant as well. <clears throat> Some before and after photos, where you can see these blank slates of mud, where we come in uh, in the 2013 photos, and the two um, where we come in and and plant the native core grass, um, and then how how much it can expand on its own, like that. Um, I'll get into that in a second. And then Grindelia on the right-hand side, the, 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 the native gum plant um, showing channels that were devoid of native gum plant. Um, and now, you know, show these great habitat features for Ridgeways rail and other, other um, songbirds as well. Um, another example of an unvegetated um, former salt pond in the Eden Landing Ecological Reserve, North Creek Marsh, in 2011. Um, basically, we had gotten rid of the, the small amounts of relatively small amounts of hybrid Spartina in this marsh. Um, and then we went in and planted the native core grass. Uh, you can see all the green plantings that have now expanded to far beyond um, the, the scale of of, of what's what's mapped in this slide. Um, you can see again the, the clean slate on the left of those of those areas where we planted and how um, how much it expands in just a few years um, in the in the right tidal environment. And there's a shot I took with my drone a couple, few, few years ago in 2019. You can see that same clean slate that in 2011, this is how much cord grass and other native vegetation, because um, it creates a surface roughness. So then other probables come in, other pickleweed and, and other native uh, vegetation across that same site. Uh, and not only the vegetation, but you know, um, now um, the it's it, this site now supports Ridgeways Rail much faster than it would have if it was allowed to, to if it was just developed on on its own without the active planting that we engaged in. We had the first Ridgeways Rail in 2018, much faster than than the 20 years or so that it normally takes for Ridgeways Rail to come into these brand new sites. And by last year, by this year, we had 13 detected in this site, which is amazing, considering you know we're in, under 2,000 probably in in the whole bay. So that's that's amazing. We don't have a lot of these. We, I wish we had drones early in the project because we would have amazing before and after photos. Um, but we we did not. This is some shots taken from helicopter back early in the day. Um, but this this shows the advance advancement of the the infestation and the changes now. We do, I wish we had more of these types of photos. But in 2003, at the Alameda Flood Control Channel, which is the original introduction site for Spartina alternate flora, the east the east coast core grass that's the parent of the of the hybrid. Uh, you can see in 2003. Take note of the the circled circled clones and the position of them. And then in 2005, just two years later, how much Spartina is along that bend in AFCC? That's a huge area, right? Um, and it just that's how that's how quickly it, it moves across these open clean slates like a petri dish um, in the mud and then now um, after we've removed the core grass and there is virtually no no non-native core grass in the entire four mile alameda flood control channel below below union city boulevard you can see the 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 long nice continuous band of native core grass along um, that runs that runs along the edge um, and you know how, how successful that has been um, it's just quite quite gratifying to see that so and the ultimate goal of all these efforts for the Spartina project, and the, the next thing I'm going to get into with, with Limonium, is you know healthy, resilient native marshes 
that can adapt on their own, um, use their own feedback loops. Um, so we, we make forward momentum with non-native Spartina removal. Uh, we engage in the restoration plantings and other enhancements, and we're seeing increasing rail populations as a result. And that's kind of the, 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 um, the goal of the whole thing. And you can see some, we have some nice photos to show sort of the, 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 the endpoints uh, of, the, of, of that effort that of course really aren't endpoints, they're just points along the way as the marshes develop, continue to develop and continue to adapt. So, um, so now I'm going to switch switch gears to um, an effort um, that uh, the California Basin Plant Council uh, has been engaging in with, along with a lot of other partners around the Bay as well, um, on invasive limonium, uh, which it, um, which is sea lavender. So we have a native sea lavender, California sea lavender, and we have um, we have. Um, a couple different non-native sea lavenders, but I'm only going to talk about the main one today because it's the main one that's also in the San Francisco Peninsula. It's the only one in the San Francisco Peninsula, as far as we know, um, that's a problem. And that's Limonium ramosissimum. I'll refer to it as Lyra from now on, or Algerian sea lavender. So it was first discovered in the San Francisco estuary in 2006-2007 um, at Sanchez Marsh down in San Mateo County, just south of SFO. Um, as you can see by the yellow star, this is an important point to remember. So Lyra grows uh, Lyra grows most vigorously and produces the most seed in the high marsh and estuary and terrestrial transition zones, so the upland transition zone, um, where it really does quite well. So it it it, it definitely spreads in the in the marsh and, and can withstand the, the the salinity of the marsh, but it does really really well in the high marsh and up into the areas like we'll see at Hearn's Head in a second, um, up above really where you get any tidal inundation, except at the highest king tides or even above that. Um, Vast majority of it is found above mean high water, um, although it has certainly colonized marsh plain and channel banks at some sites. When it gets a ton of seed in there, it's capable of doing that, uh, but it takes a while till it reaches that point. It also unfortunately grows as a substratum beneath native tidal marsh vegetation because it's such a small plant. And then it eventually over time starts to displace that native tidal marsh vegetation. So it's pretty insidious and, and can be pretty hard to, to find all of it and get thorough detection because some of the plants can be so small. So. Some pretty pictures um, taken from uh, Vanderhof, Ron Vanderhof down in Southern California, where they've had these species for a while as well. Um, um, and you know, please let us know if you if you find new infestations in areas. Um, it's, it's got very showy, beautiful flowers. Um, it's because that was you know probably one of the reasons it was introduced horticulturally. Um, and it's and it's um, in June, July is when you see the flowers. Um, it's, it kind of bolts throughout throughout May. And it's this um, it's sort of a that's a big plant right there. That's a that kind of tough, but most of them are about four inches across with these acute point, pointed tip leaves. Um, and I'll show another example here. So this is the on the left hand side, you have the, the non-native invasive uh, Lyra. And then on the right, you have our native California Californicum. Um, so you, uh, the native has these big floppy leaves, tends to be uh, have taller flower stalks, not as showy the flowers. Um, these plants are both bolting, which generally happens throughout May. It's pretty a pretty long bolting thing. And the native, the native limonium, the native sea lavender will play well with others in the marsh. It grows in conjunction with others. Um, it doesn't dominate areas, whereas the, the, the lyra really does. So this is it, when some disturbed areas at the edge of the bay, it will just take over and all that there, um, you know, was like an open area where the lyra came in and then it just exploits that disturbance and, and dominates, excluding anything else from being able to, to colonize back in from the native seed source that's right adjacent to it. Um, and, and it starts to exclude those those other plant species. So two different graduate students from Dr. Dr. Kathy Boyer at, at SFSU at San Francisco State uh, were critical. Uh, their research was critical in, in our decision to take action on this on this species because you know obviously we know there's more weeds and more work out there than we than there's money for and then there's and that there's time and energy for. You really have to make prioritization choices, right? Um, well, their research showed that the impacts and the vigorous spread of the of this of Lyra was very well documented and and really uh, was something to take seriously and try to get get on it as early as possible. Um, so Lyra and Lyra was also identified by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as one of three highest concern plant species in the San Francisco Bay Weed Management Plan. So it really showed an ideal opportunity for early detection and rapid response. Um, and I'll just say um, in bold there that you know carpets of these short rosettes of, of these plants 
Lyra and Laidu, the other the other non-native uh, invasive one, cannot provide the same vertical structure that our native wildlife need for refugia from predators, from high tide refugia when they're most vulnerable, from avian predators um, like the grindelia, like the gum, marsh gum plant that we plant for the Spartina project, uh, and other plants that have more vertical structure. So they're just these rosette plants, and they they then come in and exclude the other plants, especially in the high marsh where we really need the these uh, the uh, our wildlife to be able to to seek refuge and also to build their nest in the case of the Ridgeways Rail. Um, and uh, on, uh, this is this is a really, Limonium can be a real, and sea lavender can be a really great IPM story because manual removal can be very effective. So it's uh, unlike, like say, the hybrid Spartina, where that's, where as being a rhizomatous plant and the habitats it grows in, it's not really something we can factor in as a method. Once local stewards can pick up the 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 ball and run with it, once you these re, once uh, infestations have been reduced to a level where it's more manageable, or uh, in an early detection rapid response, a nascent infestation, having it be all all manual removal from the beginning is totally totally doable. But because the, the limonium spreads so rapidly and develops some pretty big infestations, there you know there there needed to be an infusion of work before some of these efforts could switch to manual ma manual removal um, and that's what this the, or the calepsi um, project has tried to accomplish and then turning that over to to uh, other partners like you'll hear about in a second from uh, ledge and from uh, port of san francisco so uh just to quick sh quickly show you the extent um you know it got uh, um didn't mention this in another but the the uh a seed company mistakenly identified the native the, the hybrid <laughs> mistakenly identified lira as the native limonium harvested it and put it in seed mixes that got distributed around the bay about 10 years ago. So unfortunately, it got spread to some areas that, and before our project, the Calypso project ever started, it got spread to some pretty remote areas of the bay that it would not have gotten to very quickly on the tides. It would move around on the tides, but it wouldn't have gotten established or established to the extent that it did without this assistance by humans. So. So that's why you see kind of as widespread an infestation as this map shows. Um, and we have about we have about 90 sites identified, some many of them very small to moderate, and then about 15 to 20 sizable sites, including ones up into the acres range. Uh, the current status is with Calypso was awarded our third National Fish and Wildlife NIFWF grant in December of 2020 to fund mapping and treatment in 2021 and into next year, 2022, maybe a little bit into 2023. Um, Calypso has also partnered with um, three, with five county agricultural commissioners' offices um, uh, to uh, apply for CDFA and noxious weed grant program money, um, which was originally for 18 months and luckily got extended to 36 months. And I thank the folks on this call that are part part of the San Francisco county effort um, that we're partnered with, um, and it's make, we're making really great great use of that funding. And we thank you for for um, partnering with us on that. And our goals of our, our the current goals are basically to fill in the, the mapping gaps around the estuary. Um, it's like some of the complex marshes that are very expensive to survey have very little, but they're but they do have some presence of this non-native aluminium. Um, so they're expensive to, to inventory um, and also to get, get down to the far south bay where it's where it's a very limited presence and we want to nip that in the bud while we possibly while we can. Um, then we're going to update the mapping of sites that are under active management and get all known sites, as I mentioned, about 90 uh, under act continued active management, either by contractors or by local stewards. Um, just a few quick points that, you know, we've seen a lot of variability with herbicide treatment on ammonium. Um, we have uh, we have some efficacy that can be in the in you know the near the hundred range, but a lot of times after a first application, it'll only be in this forty to fifty percent range. And this showed up photo shows area that was treated where you have you know good efficacy on one side and near nearly horrible on the on the other side. Um, so we did find that um, that we have some, found some ways through that uh, over over the years. Um, but that was some uh, in the initial seasons. We learned that's a very tough plant to kill possibly because of a very thick leaf cuticle and um, that limits the herbicide uptake and a stout tap root that allows the plants to bounce back from their reserves. Um, so much of this like plant that's pictured here uh, is brown post-treatment, but it escaped death and re-sprouted. And we, we, we saw that quite a bit early on, on in the project, especially with big established plants with a, with a big um, tap root reserve. Um, so within two or three months that that regrowth established, re-established. But we found that round, round tree round two treatment about six to eight weeks after the initial yielded much higher mortality on mature plants. And then it also catches a lot of misses because 
um, the seed bank is constantly generating it pretty much has a 12 year growing cycle. So you're all you're getting recruitment from the seed bank, especially all the way through the spring and into the early summer. So you might do a treatment in April or, or, or May and then you come back in a, in a few weeks and you'll get even more little seedlings have popped up. Um, so this second round of treatment really helps us get much greater reductions on uh, each month. So I'm almost wrapping up here. So the so um, this is another uh, yellow um, star slide. Um, so in addition to pulling, which is a lot of manual work on on limonium and herbicide, where, where needed, especially in the large infestations, we've also tested propane flaming by um, borrowing equipment from from Marin County Parks and getting a burn pim, burn burn permit from the Southern Marin Fire Protection District, and we found it very effective. Um, most effective on small plants and seedlings. It's very tedious, very time intensive, not very pleasant because of the smoke and stuff that's generated. Um, but it appears to be a lot cheaper than manual removal of thousands of seedlings. And sometimes you can get you know, so many thousands, it seems like the viability of these seeds is super, super high. It is more, more costly than herbicide application. Um, so it's probably best done as a follow-up method after some of the monocultures have been removed by one method or another, oftentimes by manual removal. But um, but it, once those mature plants are removed that are really hard to burn, um, coming back in to follow up with that, with propane flaming, uh, might be a method to, to try in some areas. And it seems like we might get some seed bank reduction on the top stratum of the soil as well from it, because we've had some amazing reductions fairly quickly, um, quicker than we get with either manual or chemical treatment at some sites in Marin where we've, where we've done this method in Sausalito and such. So who knows? And I'll just mention that that this plant is still in the early detection rapid response range, and it seems like it had some scary upland potential, um, Limonium ramosissimum. Um, this is showing it, it well, it's, it, it's well established in landscaping far above where tidal inundation ever comes, just next to the next to the bay, but not getting tidal inundation. Um, and then even up in around surrounding a pool in Sausalito adjacent to some houseboats. So you know, this could have been a could have been a much wider problem that would have also required, you know, gotten people that are doing landscaping maintenance to to use their to use the, these, you know, herbicide or other methods to to um, to remove it. So we're getting it early. And I think that hopefully that'll have a, a be, be a big benefit to the to the whole bay, including folks that don't even realize that this plant exists. So just a few sh shots of her head before I turn it over um, showing. Um, so this is, a you know, Marsh uh, Pier 98. Pier 98 um, in, uh, in in San Francisco and um, Carol Bach from Port of San Francisco I'm talking a second as well as folks from Literacy for Environmental Justice just showing the first treatment on the, the peak infestation showing how widespread the, the Lyra was at, at Hearn's Head you can all see all those plants just a big open ground that, that was very disturbed and just was colonized and dominated by this plant um, you can see six months post treatment on another area which is the same area shown in the next slide in 2021 um, that shows after the work that Ledge has been able to do to, to remove it um, and this was the ninth, ninth largest infestation in the estuary at its peak. And um, it is uh, it was about 2,000 square meters of net cover. And so it covered much more you consider the affected area. Um, Calypsy was able to reduce the infestation by about 70% after a couple of years. Um, and then by 2021, the reductions from the herbicide treatment allowed for a shift to manual removal by literacy for, for environmental justice. Um, and the, the the shift to that is is displayed here on the right where you can see after, it still required them several weeks to remove um all those plants by a dedicated team but um that's kind of the results there on the on the right hand side and i really love this shot because it shows an area where the infestation was affected by was was um still surrounded by a lot of native plants um, and our herbicide application was careful enough to preserve a lot of those native plants and then ledge went in and removed manually removed all that came back from the seed bank and all that was surviving from that area. And you can see how, what a nice, um, what a nice area that is. And that'll be enhanced as well with native plants. So, all right, so that's it for me. And I will now close that and I will turn it over to See how I do Actually, that. Uh, Can you? Why don't you leave your Heron's Head Park slides up for a minute just to give people something? Oh, sure. <laughs> That'd be great. Perfect. Okay. Um, great. Go for it. Let me just, uh, if I could just jump in. So we're not going to do Q&A. We're going to save Q&A uh, for afterwards. Um, if you are not part, of, not a presenter, uh, Anastasia, could you please turn off your video? Um, it's it's really hard. We can't manage things centrally here, so we're trying to just have speakers with video on. Um, so um, next up is Carol Bach. Um, I, 
Anastasia, you're speaking, but you're muted. Uh, you're we're not doing Q and A quite yet, okay? Um, uh, Carol uh, is with the Port of San Francisco, which has been, as as uh, Drew mentioned, is uh, supporting some of this work down by Heron's Head. And uh, I, Carol wanted to, uh, I guess, give a lead in to the next segment. So take it away. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Drew, for that great background and introduction to what we're doing at Heron's Head. Um, Good morning, everybody. My name is Carol Bach. I'm with the Port of San Francisco. And um, somebody let me know if there's any problem with my audio or anything, but I'll assume that you all can hear me. Um, so I manage the port's few uh, natural habitat areas, including um, Heron's Head Park which was formerly known as Pier 98 because once upon a time it was intended to be constructed as a new shipping terminal. That plan was abandoned in the late 70s and since then um, Heron's Head Park was constructed in 1998, the winter of 98-99 and reopened. Uh, it had been formerly fenced off to public access but it reopened in 99 as Heron's Head Park. So we don't use that antiquated term, Pier 98, anymore. Um, so since Heron's Head Park was constructed in the late 90s, the port has been working together with LEDGE. They've been uh, Literacy for Environmental Justice, or LEDGE. They've been a partner with us all these 20 plus years that we've been managing Heron's Head. Um, and the port's resources that we've had to dedicate to habitat management at Heron's Head have kind of uh, waxed and waned over the years. There were times when we had a, a substantial contract with Ledge to do habitat management um, and haven't had that as much lately um, for the past many years. But um, we applied in 2018 for funding from the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority grant program that disperses money generated by uh, Measure AA, which was passed by the voters in 2016. It's a parcel tax imposed in the nine Bay Area counties, and the funds are dedicated to uh, primarily to wetland habitat restoration in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we were very fortunate to get one of those San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority grants um, in the second round of funding in 2019. And that has enabled us to enter into a new grant funded contract with Literacy for Environmental Justice for five years of hands on habitat restoration work at Heron's Head Park. Um, so we are just the the grant was um, to fund five years of cultivation, planting and invasive species removal. We are just now entering the second of the first two years that we have under contract. And uh, Patrick Rump and Nina, oh shoot, sorry Nina, I'm going to mispronounce your last name, so I'm just not going to do it. Um, Patrick and Nina can describe uh, Ledge's work at Heron's Head. So um, we're going to have two years of hands-on habitat restoration work with Ledge. Then we're going to have a pause for about six months while we construct the Heron's Head Park Shoreline Resilience Project, which is funded by two other grants, one from the California State Ocean Protection Council and one from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And that uh, project is going to construct a living shoreline to control erosion and uh, improve habitat at Heron's Head Park. So once that construction is completed, uh, then we'll bring ledge back um, for three more years of planting, invasive species removal, um, and monitoring of the work that they've been doing. And uh, I just really want to 
thank uh, Drew and Chris and um, our other partners who have enabled us to get to this point with the uh, invasive Lamonia management that in, during this first um, year is something that Ledge, Ledge has really been focused on. Uh, in 2019, I was at uh, the IPM meeting requesting uh, variance and authorization to use Imazapir at Heron's Head Park. Um, and that effort has brought us to the point that we can manage the Lyra population manually, which is was always the goal. So I'm really pleased for the support that we've gotten to do that. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Literacy for Environmental Justice. And, and let me and just introduce uh, Patrick. Patrick Rump is a uh, director of stewardship programs uh, for Ledge, and Anina Omomo is restoration coordinator. And I think you're going to do sort of a tag team. Um, can you, um, let's see here, can you see the screen? Can you see the? Well, we lost your. We lost the presentation. We have um, kind of like your file document okay. right now. Wait. Okay. Wait just a second. See if it pops up. Sometimes okay. Uh, well, um, I'll introduce us real quickly while okay. we're waiting. So, Literacy for okay. Environmental Justice. Uh, we're a Bayview Hunters Point organization um, focused on kind of the intersection of uh, ecological stewardship. Uh, environmental education, workforce development, and, uh, you know, enacting large-scale urban greening projects. So one of our favorite projects is Heron's Head Park. Uh, we were instrumental in uh, creating the Eco Center at Heron's Head and some of the early programs and stewardship. Um, Carol had kind of mentioned that, like, um, some of the funding for the stewardship has waxed and waned. And uh, we're super excited that we're kind of back into, like, a wax – uh, waxing period again uh, because it's such a unique and special site and Chris I think we lost the uh, presentation again hello I see half of it uh, that's weird well I'll just keep I'll keep going okay there we go um, so um, I think what we want to just do is just kind of like talk a little bit about um, our current role there um, with our Eco Apprentice program. Um, Nina is, hold on one second. I don't know if um, you guys are hearing me, but um, I'm going to introduce uh, yeah. Nina Omomo yeah. a little bit we, to talk a little bit you. about can hear okay, you. great about the, about the work that we're doing, and um, you know just kick it back to me when when you're ready. But I wanted to kind of give an overview, and um, that's about it. Is it visible yet? It appears to be visible. Okay, it appears I to be think, visible. I think Nina. <laughs> I think someone has has to unmute Nina, or I don't know if she can unmute herself. Oh, or if I need uh, to unmute. She can unmute herself, but I can try to go in there and see. Everything's moving slowly. So while we're waiting here uh, in the marsh plain, uh, she says she can't. She tried. So we're looking at here in the marsh plain. Um, you know, there, that little black hunched uh, item is one of our eco apprentices, and the bare spots are pretty much like the infestation of Lyra that we've been had been removing. Um, and, you know, I think, um, you know, I think Carol had kind of talked about the different stages of the project, but I can say, um, when, when Ledge was involved with this site back in like the 2000s, there was actually like a handful of Lyra, um, um, sprouts on site. And then to have seen it explode and largely take over to the extent of approximately three acres of the, of the tidal marsh wetland what was pretty alarming um, to be able to, but what, what it's been encouraging is to be able to like kind of collaborate with the port, the Measure AA funding, uh, Cal IFSPE's work, the WMA work, 
uh, to get in there and bring in the hand, you know, to bring in the crews and do the final hand removal has been super rewarding. Um, currently, I guess you could advance the slide if you want. I'm not sure if Nina is able to actually speak. Me, I, I okay, can't I'm seem to unmute her. Can you hear me now? <laughs> oh, yes. okay, okay, okay. All right, okay. so I'll, I'll turn it over to Nina, but I was just about to say, well, you know, um, yeah, why don't you jump jump in and then I'll, I'll, I'll tag team at the, at the end here. But this is some of the work that we've been doing the last few months. Here's uh, Nina Amomo, our Habitat Restoration Coordinator. Hi, sorry about that, everyone. I'm um, I'm on my phone, so it's a little different on the computer. Um, yeah, thank you, Patrick, for the good introduction, and thank you, Drew and Carol, for another great introduction. Um, yeah, we just have a couple pictures for you guys. I think the whole overview has been great already, and we'll just add a little bit to that from our perspective of doing the manual uh, removal there over, I mean, by the time we did it, it was almost a year um, of working at Heronside doing removal. Some months were like one or two days, and then some months we were out there three times a week. So um, just depended the time of the year. But um, as you can see on this slide, we have a good before and after picture of hand removal that we did. Um, um, it was pretty dense in this area. So removal takes, I mean, we got we got pretty fast at it by the end of it, but um, this probably takes us like an hour or two with a crew of maybe like four or five, maybe six people for this um, area. And then on the next slide, yeah, this is just more example. You can see in the right photo, we have some people working in the back. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty monogamous work, but. Um, nice to be outside it's nice to be spending the day at the park um the cover as you can see can get pretty dense um i think Drew had some good pictures too where density was um you know 80 even 90 percent um these pictures show some pretty mature um limoniums that get pretty big so um yeah they're probably either re-sprouts for over like a year or two since Drew sprayed um, or it was they've just been there maturing for a while but um, yeah when they get big um, they get hard to pull they have a big long tap root that you have to get um, with the we use a hori hori which is like a soil knife um, to pull them out with the root and then we can go to the next slide um, yeah, this is just kind of a brief overview um, of what we kind of brought to round out this whole project. Um, we really worked with our Eco Public Program, which is a young young adult youth a young adult um, program that we run through our um, workforce development sector at Ledge, and it comprises of four or five or six um, young young adult age, like 18 to 25. Um, and then we essentially kind of like a paid internship. We do pay people um, to do this work, obviously. And um, it is, the purpose of it is to put the next generation of young folks into the green workforce with the idea that um, they start out with no, no really resume or no really experience and then we can give them that experience through doing work like this um, working at our nursery over in Bayview um, but yeah doing this was I was an eco apprentice when I did it and then this was the first project I worked on as like the restoration lead so it's definitely a project that um, is close to me it was my first big um, kind of spearhead of leadership that I had within um, working at the organization. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we would really spend a lot of time out there. And I really think it's a great way for people to get that workforce development and to get paid to do it as well. And to get, um, you know, we do like a lot of education and a lot of, um, you know, plant ID and stuff like that out there as well. So it's not just, it's not just a, a labor force. 
we really like to, you know, incorporate um, environmental education and awareness within it. And I think we do a pretty good job of doing that. Um, and then as Carol mentioned, this coming year, we're going to continue with the Living Shoreline Project um, for the next five years. This would be the end of the first year. And then this winter, we're planting about 14,000 um, wetland plants um, at Heron's Head that we've grown at our nursery. So that's the next step for us. And we'll be out there hopefully um, the end of this month and then definitely January, February, um, March, we'll be out there planting these plants. And that consists of um, a lot of different plants, but like um, we'll be doing a lot of gum plants, a lot of um, frankenia. Um, those are the two big ones that we're doing. But, um, yeah, so it's really important that we did that removal and had have the space to do these plantings for um, really like regenerating and restoring this ecosystem. Um, yeah, I don't know if Patrick wants to add anything, but I will just say it's really great that we got to come in after Drew because um, there really was a there was a lot when we first got out there of limonium left. And I think now, as far as we've gotten with it, with the last year, I really think um, as long as we keep going out there and planting these native plants, I don't think we'll have to spray again out there, considering how under control it is now. Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll, pop, I'll pop in a couple little things. Um, you know, I think in the history of the project, in terms of the tidal wetland restoration at Heron said, we've never planted 14,000 plants and then a subsequent planting of 5,000 plants the next year. So we're really excited about this two-pronged process of um, intensive removal with, uh, you know, seed-specific genetic uh, outplanting. And I think going back to Drew's presentation earlier, like the species that we'll be reintroducing into these areas where the lyra mats were, um, kind of contain that like vertical diversity that creates that um, refugia that, that birds need during high tide events and diversifies the marsh plain. Um, so we're extremely excited about that. Um, I'll just also say too that this project's been incredibly very cool because it's it's provided us an opportunity to have volunteers and workforce interns, you know, grow the plants, collect the seed, um, do the planting, um, do the removal and do the outplanting and do some of the monitoring for the project. So we're also able to kind of introduce the habitat restoration cycle uh, to the next generation of, of workforce interns. And, you know, working at Heron's Head Park is just a completely inspiring location. Um, and really is, I think, one of these examples that nature can exist in a city and nature can provide um, access to people, inspiration to people, as well as, you know, simple things like flood control and uh, carbon sequestration, which is important in an environmental community like or environmental justice community like Bayview Hunters Point. And um, it's also I feel like we're at a point where with the collaboration of all these different entities, um, if we continue to stay on top of the project through ongoing weeding and, and monitoring uh, with the outplanting, I, I'm hoping that we probably won't have to use herbicides in the future to control this population. And um, I think that's really about it. So um, excited about it. I think it's gonna be interesting to see how the project evolves in the next couple of years. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Chris. Thank you so much. This is all really inspiring work and just kind of overwhelming the, the scale of it all too with, with, between the limonium and the Spartina. Um, what a huge area of land to try to manage. And um, I'm just super happy that um, with the, the with both of them, but especially with the limonium, we've, we've gotten to the point where we can do the hand removal and maybe indefinitely, uh, which was the goal all along. So that's that's um, really great. We are running late. And so I what I'm going to do is move Q&A. I mean, I want to make sure we get uh, Peter and Cree.
uh, and their presentation, which is also about invasive weeds. And um, so I'm going to uh, push off Q&A. We have a little buffer time there uh, and turn it over to Peter. So Peter, are you there? <clears throat> yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Okay, cool. Peter Brastow is the uh, biodiversity coordinator for San Francisco Department of the Environment. And Cree Morgan is the agricultural commissioner for the city and county of San Francisco. And um, they're gonna tell you about a situation, a situation that sort of popped up on short notice and required immediate action. And um, uh, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. So go for it, Peter. All right, thanks, Chris. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, just a couple slides here. Um, I'll let, uh, I'm gonna, I'll introduce myself a little bit more and then, and Cree as well. And then I'll flip to the next slide. And then after that, I'm pretty much gonna hand it over to the, uh, over to Cree, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna drive. He'll, uh, he'll ask me to advance when he wants to. So again, my name is Peter Brasto. I've been at Environment for nine years. I've been involved in ecological restoration and stewardship in San Francisco for 27 years over. Um, amazingly, it's first at the National Park Service in the GGNRA and then and then um, founding and leading nature in the city and then and for the last nine years at uh, working with Chris. And so um, one of the hats that I've worn over the years has been kind of the de facto chair of the San Francisco weed management area. And so that's the that's the hat that I'm wearing right now in um, in making and in, in just um, starting off this presentation with you all. So Cree, why don't you um, introduce yourself a little bit further, and then I'll flip to the next slide. Excellent, thanks, Peter. Um, great, great presentations, and we're going to have to try to live up to Drew's presentation. That was that was fascinating. I want to go back. So um, I'm Cree Morgan. I've been I'm the Agricultural Commissioner and the Food of Waste and Measures for the City and County of San Francisco. Uh, I've been in this position for five years. I have previous to this position, I worked in Sonoma County as an Agriculture Director and Environmental Manager for about 17 years. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, false yellowhead or Districtia viscosa that we found out at Hunters Point uh, Naval Shipyard. Do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah, great. Uh, and just to say, and just to give also cred uh, to Phil Calhoun, who works with Cree, who's the one who actually put this whole presentation together. <laughs> and gotcha. then, uh, thank you, Phil. I, I'm not sure he's on the call. He wasn't able to make it, but he did all most of the heavy lifting and prepared this presentation. So I'm very grateful to all the hard work. And Cree, Cree, could I just butt in? If you could get a little bit closer to the microphone, the sound's not quite there. Okay, I can try that. Does that help? Okay. All right, good. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide, and I'm just gonna give a quick, um, uh, you know, very quick update on the on the weed management area as a whole, just as a reminder for to folks for what it is. Uh, and I saw Doug Johnson join the call a little while ago, and he's been active at the state level with uh, um, promoting and coordinating weed management areas all around California, which have been in existence for, oh gosh, over 20 years, I guess, uh, since the 90s. And essentially, it's a it's an entity that is a, a, a collaboration of agencies or and organizations at the county level, and uh, it has been over the years um, coordinated by and funded by uh, CDFA at the state level. Uh, that that funding and coordination has ebbed and flowed over the years, um, and so uh, so our kind of you know work together in San Francisco under the under the banner of the San Francisco weed management area has also ebbed and flowed over the years um, but we we were able to get some some funding recently that went through uh, into the agricultural commissioner's office and I'll um, and Kiri will talk more about that starting on the next slide and then we'll move on to talking about detrichia but just in terms of the SFWMA Essentially, what we are now is a, is a collection of folks with whom I communicate um, things that are going on in San Francisco regarding weeds. So, for example, you know, with this project that we're going to present to you today, I've just been trying to get the word out to all the folks who have been interested, um, particularly in invasive weeds and wildlands in San Francisco, about what's going on. So that's kind of in a nutshell what the SFWMA has been uh, for the last few years. Uh, and so I have an email list. If you'd like to join that, uh, just let me know, email me or chat me or whatever. Um, and we'll, we'll keep you informed about invasive weeds in wildlands and natural areas in San Francisco. Uh, and thanks again for joining today. And uh, like I said, I'm going to drive, but I'm going to let Cree take it over from here. 
Great, thanks, Peter. And yeah, I want to just put another plug in for the WMA. I will be as uh, brief as I can, so we go with that. Um, so yeah, we uh, we got a report uh, from a citizen scientist about this. Um, well, actually, I should start with the here on the slide. So yes, we were able to get a NOx seed grant program from uh, CDFA to help fund the invasive sea lavender, and that was very exciting. We got to restore the weed management funding. Uh, I won't go into the details of where those funds came from, um, but they were extended. It's exciting, and uh, looks like we're going to keep having a program as long as we can keep having some fun with life. Um, so we originally only had one species under um, under the the grant, which was the without the ammonium, and now we um, discovered another slide, another um, another uh, species up there. So go ahead, next slide. Oops, sorry. Hang on. Here we go. So, um, false yellowhead, um, Restrictia viscosa, it's a Mediterranean plant. Uh, it's been widely uh, discussed and basically going back into history. Galen, the famous um, Roman uh, botanist or physiologist, that he actually documented this species. It's got a lot of medicinal uses. Great plant in the Mediterranean, not so great in California. So, what we were really concerned about was, as you, many of you are probably aware, there's a cousin, Restrictia graviolin. That was first discovered, I believe, in Santa Clara in 83, and in less than 10 years, it was in 38 different counties. So it's uh, wind dispersed, highly likely to spread, and we were very concerned that we didn't want to see uh, the Sosa follow the path that Gabriel. Next slide, please. Uh, so this was the original uh, report we got. Uh, thank you to um, the citizen scientists that discovered this plant out there. And so we got the recording of the message. It had the, uh, of the findings. It had a GPS coordinate. Go ahead and go to the next slide. We took a, uh, a official sample, and I don't know if you're aware, but the uh, CDFA has a plant diagnostic center where you can send in samples, and they will have experts identify. It. So we did so, and they came back as the A-rated species of Pacificosa. Obviously, that's a huge issue. Um, and just briefly, uh, California weeds are given ratings by CDFA, mainly for a combination of factors, but their likelihood of spread and their negative impact on the environment. So this is given an A rating, which is the highest rating. Um, and I am actually, as a commissioner of the county, mandated to deal with the A rated. So it wasn't a question that we had to do something about it, but then what, what could we do about it? Um, so go ahead and uh, next slide. Oh, thank you. That's very good. Oh, so, yep. <laughs> I should have reviewed this. I did look at it briefly, but I, yeah. So basically, yeah, it's, a, good. It's a good, a good. I mean, it's a accurate rating. A previous slide included lists of other information about other rated species. But the first thing, as you can imagine, with any new species find, is to limit how widespread it is. So Hunter's Point is a, um, a challenging location um, because of its. Uh, a lot going on out there, and we'll talk a little bit more about what the features of the site are. But this is some pictures of me and my uh, one of my ag inspectors, Victor Rubinovich, and we went out there and learned how to determine the dystrichia, which wasn't that hard because it was everywhere. Um, and you'll see lots of pictures of this plant coming forward. So uh, the little inset aerial photo is Hunter's Point. Um, so this is some more uh, exciting pictures, and you can see pretty much every one of the large plants you see here is dystrichia. Um, it's starting in the upper right, you can see the heavily seeded plant that every flower has gone to seed uh, with a wind dispersed uh, species. We were very anxious about disturbing this, and that's her, uh, why Bill included that picture in the lower right. Uh, I believe that's from Alien 2, where uh, Ripley's going into that uh, nursery with all the alien seed uh, egg pods. So we were very anxious about this spreading because obviously, with wind dispersal, um, you, know, you bump into that plant the wrong way and you didn't have. 500 seeds drifting down the wind. Um, it also happened to be in and around um, uh, a police evidence yard. That's where you see that um, uh, mobile attack vehicle or whatever that thing is near the fence. Uh, so, and then the other one, the picture in the lower left, is um, actually a much larger plant than you can see there, but it's growing right up against this water station. So, anyway, uh, next slide. So we did the limitation, uh, like I mentioned, it's a federal property. There's a lot going on. There's um, some serious um, uh, chemical and radiological contamination. There's lots of areas that are off site. There's contractors and fences and cones everywhere. It was really complicated to figure out what was going on and where we had access to. But luckily, it was pretty well located, uh, lo 
you know, limited to one spot on the uh, property. And there's been so much development. I think they may have either gotten rid of some of the other ones through um, capturing it or uh, we're not entirely sure this is the first year we found it. So we haven't actually seen how far it spread, but we found all the adults we could. Um, and like I mentioned, it's highly likelihood of this to moving off site. The size of the plants and the number of plants, we assume that it had been there for a couple of years because plants don't get to be that large overnight. Um, also, we didn't really have a established uh, tools, and so we um, kind of had to make some of this up on our own. And again, thank you so much to all the partners that helped us with this. Um, and I think there's a slide that mentions those later. So I won't that in here. Uh, but we had a lot of help to make the project. Next slide. Hey, hey Cree, excuse me. Can you, uh, maybe you might want to hold your mic up a little bit closer to your mouth or something. It's still being really muddled. muddled. Sorry about that. I, I didn't bring my good headphones home. so That's much better. Thank you. That's much better. I will work on that. So uh, here's a picture of me and Peter. And you can see that giant plant that's what four times bigger than us is a giant districtia. So that was the back end of that one that we saw in the previous slide. We, we called that the mother plant because it was the largest one we could see on the site. But we don't know which one was first and where it started spreading. Um, all right, uh, next slide. So here's the one where we had all our helpers. Uh, so I want to thank Amy Brunel, who is one of my colleagues in the Department of Public Health, uh, Matt Pruitt, Bruce Fazdick, Doug Johnson, who's on the call, Peter, obviously, uh, Christina, who's on the call, Mark, and Patricia, and I don't see uh, Drew also had played a small role in this as well. So thanks to everybody. Um, so this is some pictures of the eradication. Um, we were able to amend our Noxious Week grant program to get some of those funds to be used uh, that were originally designed for the ammonium process to be used for the process. Also, the Navy was, was helpful in that we started with the idea that we were going to have to deal with most of it, and the Navy was unaware of this. And then when we brought this into their attention, they decided to help us by bringing this into their maintenance plan. And we're not exactly sure what their level of funding is going to be going forward, but we were able to knock all the adults down and encapsulate all of the seeds. So at this point, it will just be regrowth getting started from the seed bed. Um, so I'm excited that this will, um, you know, at least we got a good portion of the work done so that any other further work won't be as impactful as it. Because again, those seeds are all ready to roll. And um, as you can imagine, being wind dispersed as well as um, water dispersed and being so close to the edge of the bay, there's a lot of areas around this site that we were concerned about it spreading to. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. The more more work of what we were doing, you can see. Um, I think that's actually still there in the in the picture. Um, we were very careful to uh, you know put everything in a bag before we started cutting those branches, so that if the seeds were knocked off, they would go into the bag. I don't remember exactly how many bags. I think there's a picture of a, of a whole dumpster coming up here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, great work from all of our partners. Next slide. Uh, looks like these are some of the photos and maybe a video, and I don't know if Bill intended us to play this video. I oh, did. yeah, he did. Let's see if we can get it to go. Um, shoot, how's that going to work? Oh, crap. You know what? I, since we're so out of time, I think. Yeah. We, we, um, we can always talk about this later. It's not going to yeah, be. The, yeah, so the let's let's go to the next slide. Whoops, there we go. Perfect. Um, so you can imagine there's a lot of stuff out there and, and obviously the plant grew all over, up and around it. So there was a lot of interesting removal of things uh, going on there. Um, the SFPD was helpful. This is the back end of their uh, evidence, one of their evidence yards. And so we had to get their help to get access. Go to go next slide. Um, and you can see a little before and after. So one side you can see just plants everywhere, including that large one um, like in the back there. Um, at this point, no adults are on the site. So that's very exciting. But again, uh, pack vehicle uh, before and after. Um, so <laughs> it was amazing. Everywhere we looked, we kept finding. Uh, so here's another example. This is um, along the edge. One of the parcels, the entire um, site was paved over the many years that the Navy was operating it. And then they've been slowly cleaning it up. And they did turn one of the parcels back into a field. And that was the most concerning because obviously with all the open land, they were sure how widespread they get out there. It was around several places, but um, I guess we'll see more next year when we find out what the seeds are. Um, here we go, there's that dumpster. Uh, so it looks like we had 200 construction grade garbage bags. Um, we had them double bagged and it was three mil plastic, so it's very, it's 
dumpster. Um, we ended up uh, not using the dumpster. Uh, there was some concern about how to get it safely disposed of. Obviously, you know, moving stuff through the channels of uh, waste management, there's a potential for things to break open or fall off the truck or whatever. So we were anxious about that. So we ended up at this point, we just put everything in bags. And because there are so many buildings out there that are abandoned, but still relatively uh, waterproof, uh, we had the Navy store the bags in one of those abandoned buildings. So we're going to basically come up with a better plan to dispose of them, uh, either burying them somewhere on site or taking them somewhere. I was just didn't want to see this go into the regular waste stream that potentially have There's a great picture that Phil took of uh, bees, and they were very happy out there with those with this plant. So they lost some of their uh, foraging flies, but that's the uh, necessary thing. Um, so you can see here we talked about uh, mon annual monitor. So we're not sure, you know, if it did blow or a drift in the water over the Candlestick Point or any of the other surrounding lands. We did a survey, didn't see it, but again, it's one of those things where we don't know if they know, but we'll keep looking. So. Um, I don't think we have a lot of identification slides in here, but if anyone sees this plant or something looks like it, you know, let us know. We'll take a look. Um, so, yeah, it's not hard to find once you once you know what it looks like. Um, but there are a lot of yellow leaves, sunflower types. Uh, anyway, um, that's all we have for now. Hopefully, that was quick enough, Chris. Um, I didn't want to rush through so great presentation, but I also didn't want to. We have any questions or we have the questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Peter. And yeah, we're and uh, yeah, we're out of time, but that was um, this is one of those situations where we don't have a choice. We have to we have to control it. And and how do we do it quickly without spreading the seeds all over the place? And um, and wow, you know, big kudos to all the people with eagle eyes out there who are watching for this stuff. Um, and to Phil for jumping on it. Phil Calhoun really deserves a lot of credit because he he just got right on this. Um, we now um, so we have a, we have a lot of uh, a lot of material and and 15 minutes left um, for we're just going to devote the last 15 minutes to Q and A.